Thank you very much. I want to thank the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council for inviting me to be a part of this important conference. Uh, I was asked to talk about school policies, and, uh, and I think I would be remiss not to point out that school policies don't occur in a vacuum, that when we're asking school boards and school administrators to do something, to implement a program or a framework, uh, that there may be broader school safety concerns uh, and certainly those are, uh, uh, can be quite pressing and in some cases can, uh, can impair and interfere with efforts to, uh, to implement bully prevention programs. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about school safety concerns, particularly zero tolerance and, and concerns with building security. I'm going to contrast that with some factual information about the, the safety of our schools and then I'll get to those policy recommendations and some problems associated with implementing them. So school policies are very much shaped by fears of school violence. Since the 1990s, recurrent school shootings uh, have brought bullying to national attention because of a perceived link. Uh, and the fear of school shootings has dramatically changed our school discipline and safety practices, often uh, so extensively that we don't really recognize how much things have changed from, from the 70s or the 80s or, uh, and into the 90s. Uh, but school discipline and safety practices that we see today uh, in some cases actually conflict with effective school bullying policies. Uh, let me talk about some of the competing demands that school administrators have to consider. Uh, building security, uh, implementing school shooting drills, uh, following zero tolerance practices, and of course the ever-present pressure for, for high stakes and testing. Uh, when I approach schools about bullying programs and interventions, uh, they list these things as, as competing priorities. Uh, and of course, bullying has been highly publicized as, as one of the motives for, for school shootings. And this has been, uh, uh, this is an important context for bully prevention programs. Uh, and, and this report was, was largely substantiated by studies of school shootings, uh, in particular the Secret Service and Department of Education study, which found that uh, the majority of, of attackers were uh, felt bullied or persecuted. So there is a Columbine effect, effect of school shootings that have transformed school safety and discipline. Uh, primarily the, the expansion of zero tolerance from not just firearms, but all sorts of toys and, and seemingly in, innocuous behaviors. Uh, and after each school shooting, we see a, a, a kind of episode of, or epidemic of, uh, of suspensions for zero tolerance policies, going pow pow with your finger, for example. Uh, or this boy who brought a pencil to school and made gun noises pointing the pencil and was was suspended from school. Uh, but beyond those sort of high profile, seemingly ridiculous cases, we have suspension as a kind of everyday practice in schools. Schools are, 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 are suspending students for less serious behavior, uh, for behavior that uh, previously was not handled by school suspension. And this has raised a lot of concerns about uh, racial disparities and possible discriminatory practices. Uh, and so those are pressing priorities uh, that schools must consider uh, when also faced with the problem of bullying. Uh, the Sandy Hook shooting was a, was a terribly traumatic event, as many of these school shootings have been, uh, and that trauma has been carried out through our society. All of us have been exposed uh, to these terrible images uh, and thoughts and fears and concerns, uh, which very much shape uh, school practices. Uh, we've seen in the, in the ensuing year a rush among schools to institute all sorts of building security measures such as bulletproof building entrances, uh, metal detectors and x-rays. Uh, we've hired law enforcement officers and school security officers. Uh, we've seen more cameras put into schools. And in some schools, those cameras are monitored actively, which requires more staff and, and more equipment. Uh, we've also talked about arming our teachers or training our teachers in firearms. So all sorts of ideas that are pressuring upon schools. Uh, these are all expensive. Uh, we're talking about multi-million dollar expenditures for school systems. Uh, and these school security measures deprive schools of resources that could be allocated uh, to anti-bullying programs and counseling services. Uh, in my own, uh, my own community, the local school has run out of its federal funding for its anti-bullying program, and so it's on the chopping block for balancing the school's budget. At the same time on that budget, there's a proposal to install new locks on all of the classroom doors so that the teachers can lock out an intruder with a gun. So there's a clear issue of what are we going to choose? Are we going to favor security? And many parents say, we want those door locks. Maybe we don't need the anti-bullying program. 
Uh, it's a terrible uh, dilemma to have to choose between uh, uh, security and anti-bullying. Uh, but there's also an impact on the school climate of all these security measures, and particularly when we have school shooter drills. Now, it's fine if these are practiced on weekends, but they're also practiced with students involved. Uh, I'm going to show you some shocking uh, videos of, of involving students and think about the impact on them of what it says about their school and what they can expect about their own safety. Uh, as shocking and troubling as this, this is to see as a slide, think about the impact of this on children in their schools, that, that this is what they might need to prepare for. This extends down to elementary school. We have young children being taught to, uh, to hide from, from intruders. Uh, but in fact, all of this concern with school safety involves a high degree of exaggeration uh, and, and level of fear that I think is, is largely unwarranted. School age homicides rarely occur at school. Most homicides occur in other residences and other locations. And in fact, school violence has declined. I'm going to show you some quick facts about that. Uh, looking at some CDC data, we can see that school age homicides are an important concern, uh, but it's not the homicides. The homicides are not occurring at school. Uh, they're occurring 99% uh, of the time outside of school. Uh, a graduate student and I looked at some uh, FBI NIBRS data at homicides in general across the country, and you see homicides occur in residences, they occur in the streets and parking lots. Uh, they very rarely occur on schools and college campuses, although they get tremendous attention and they create a false perception that those sites are, are dangerous places. School-associated violent deaths, not just students, but, but staff members and adults also have been declining. Uh, and if we actually look statistically at the probability of a student being a victim of a homicide at school, with over 100,000, 125,000 schools in the United States, the average school can expect a student homicide about once every 6,000 years. School violence, not just homicides, has declined. If we look at uh, aggravated assault, robbery, and, and forcible rape, serious violent crime, uh, the crime rate, according to the National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, school crime has declined uh, substantially since the 1990s. So school policies on bullying have to be disentangled from concerns about school shootings and school safety. So let's talk about what those policies are. Uh, those policies need to be based on the recognized harms associated with bullying, not the fear of school shootings. Now, 49 states have passed legislation about bullying, but this legislation is quite varied from state to state. There's no systematic uh, blueprint legislation. And largely, the legislation directs schools to come up with their own policies about bullying, and those policies maybe are guided to address things like defining and prohibiting bullying and mandating staff reporting for bullying. Policy recommendations, there's a fair amount of uh, literature on policy recommendations, and, and uh, I think some that you're going to be hearing uh, throughout this conference uh, suggest sort of five areas of policy recommendations for schools. Uh, Sue Limber, my colleague uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from Clemson, has, uh, has made some suggestions, and I uh, we've made some suggestions on policy recommendations, uh, and they fall into five major areas. First of all, clarifying the definition of bullying and educating the school community uh, about bullying. Uh, detecting uh, and intervening to stop bullying. Schools need policies to recognize that this is something uh, that they do not want to have present, uh, but not to use uh, zero tolerance measures, which have largely been proven to be uh, counterproductive. Third, uh, to use valid measures to assess bullying. Uh, many of the measures used to assess bullying rates are of un uncertain validity. Uh, fourth, we want to use evidence-based strategies to reduce bullying and intervene uh, with victims, perpetrators, and bystanders. And finally, we want to recognize when bullying is criminal or, or discriminatory. Let me elaborate on each of those uh, in turn because each of them has some, some challenges. There are challenges with the definition of bullying, with the detection of bullying, with the assessment of bullying, uh, and then the use of programs to, uh, uh, to respond to it. Policy problem one, uh, state definitions of bullying tend to be very inclusive. They include uh, almost any form of intentional peer aggression. Uh, they rarely mention the power imbalance requirement that you uh, heard about earlier this morning. Uh, they really conflict with the CD definition and conventional definitions. Uh, and evidence-based programs use that more narrow definition of bullying, but they don't line up and they don't match with the definitions of bullying that we're seeing uh, in our schools. Policy problem two, 
uh, students are unwilling to report bullying. No surprise, there's a code of silence, there's a reluctance to, uh, to deal with this, uh, and we need a more supportive school climate and a change in peer culture so that students understand the difference between snitching and seeking help uh, and don't feel that uh, it's uh, social suicide for them to uh, uh, raise concerns about bullying. Schools need more systematic ways uh, to identify victims of bullying, uh, and schools have tried tip lines, uh, peer nomination surveys, uh, and simply getting staff to be more active in monitoring and inquiring uh, when they suspect that bullying or some type of peer conflict is taking place. Policy problem number three, schools rely on anonymous self-report surveys. This is the quick, easy way if you're a researcher and you want to gather some data, give an anonymous self-report survey. You don't need parental consent. You can gather a lot of data quickly, but how good is the data? Uh, anonymous surveys can't be validated against independent criteria. Uh, we can validate self-report with anonymous self-report, but there we're largely measuring the consistency of students' answers, uh, not the actual validity with some independent criterion. Our, our own research looking at students' understanding of bullying, their conception of bullying, finds that their self-reports uh, are, are often erroneous because they use different conceptions of bullying uh, and may not be very consistent even within a survey in what they think bullying is or isn't. Policy problem four is that uh, policies need to encourage evidence-based programs. I recall testifying before our state legislature, uh, all we wanted to do was insert that training about bullying programs be training in evidence-based bullying programs. Inserting evidence-based was controversial in the Virginia General Assembly uh, and was opposed by many folks who, who mistrusted this idea of, of relying on scientific research rather than one's you know, deeply held philosophy and values. Um, many bully prevention programs, in fact, have little or no scientific support. Uh, certainly the programs you've heard about today uh, have been studied, uh, and there's, there's reasonable support for, for using them. But if you look at the programs actually used in schools, uh, they're often motivational speakers, uh, one day, one and done type of, uh, of programs of unknown effectiveness, and they're very popular. Uh, if you read their websites, they're in more schools and have impacted more students than all of our other bully prevention programs. Uh, policy problem number five, bullying and harassment are often confused and, and used interchangeably. Uh, you heard today that, uh, from, from Sue Limber that, uh, that harassment is a term with, with legal significance, legal standing, there's a legal history around that. Uh, bullying doesn't appear in Black's Law Dictionary. Uh, there isn't a legal tradition around bullying. And, uh, and school policies uh, and state legislation often use those terms uh, interchangeably. Harassment, the major difference, harassment doesn't require a power imbalance. Uh, and as you heard already, the uh, U.S. Department of Education in, in 2010 sent out a Dear Colleague letter, which pointed out that in schools' efforts to address the problem of bullying, they might also be dealing with behavior that constitutes violations of federal anti-discrimination laws. For example, when bullying is also sexual harassment. Uh, and the law uh, identifies a number of federal statutes uh, that, uh, uh, that, that schools need to recognize whenever discrimination occurs on the basis of race, color, or national origin, sex, uh, or disability status. And just last year, uh, the U.S. Department of Education also addressed a dear colleague letter to the problem of, uh, of disability status because students with disability status are, are frequent targets of bullying. And in dealing with this through anti-bullying programs, they might fail to recognize that the, that the bullying might be sufficiently severe that it's denying the student a free and appropriate public education. Uh, the U.S. DOE, DOE made some uh, excellent recommendations for bullying of students with disabilities. Uh, but I'd like to sort of remove the with disabilities uh, qualifier to those recommendations and suggest that these are actually excellent recommendations for, for all forms of bullying. And that really takes me to, well, let me just say that not only is the U.S. DOE concerned about uh, harassment and, and legal action, uh, but since the 1999 Davis versus Monroe Supreme Court opinion, uh, parents also have a right of legal action. Uh, and we also have seen lawsuits in which parents in the community uh, have, have been able to successfully sue schools uh, for victimization of their, uh, 
of their children. And here are a couple of cases. There are other uh, cases on record that can be, uh, can be examined, typical forms of bullying that have had uh, uh, serious consequences. So uh, the GOE gave a uh, congressional report on the, the extent to which states provide coverage for, uh, for schools. Uh, and there's an important policy gap, which is that federal protections from bullying are largely limited and piecemeal. They're concerned with bullying when it occurs to someone based on sex or race or color or national origin or disability status uh, with no real federal right to education for all students. Let me suggest to you that New Jersey and other states have su suggested that all students are entitled to protection from unlawful discrimination and harassment, uh, no less so than we as adults enjoy. So finally, in conclusion, let me say that the overarching concern is that protection from bullying should be a basic right of all children and youth. Thank you.